Hello, and welcome to Women Leaders in Cybersecurity. I'm Judy Germano, and honored to share this time with you today for our CLE program on increasing board and executive accountability. Not that we're calling to increase the accountability, but addressing the trend of how board responsibility and executive leadership team responsibility is continuing to increase uh, and needs to be a higher priority than it already is uh, with regard to boards and executive leadership teams. There have been a number of issues highlighting the importance of this topic at the top levels of companies, including most recently the SEC's March 2022 proposed guidance on cybersecurity. I am honored to have Carolyn Welshens of the SEC here to speak with us, and then followed by a rock star panel with Carolyn, as well as two corporate board directors, uh, CISO, and a, a, a deputy general counsel, who will talk about both the SEC guidelines and the many other issues for boards and executive accountability. I want to thank our sponsors, Craig Newmark of Craig Newmark Philanthropies, and the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation for making these events possible. We have been doing the Women Leaders in Cybersecurity program at NYU since I've been honored to be involved in it since 2016 when we created the event to bring together women leaders in the field on substantive topics of importance in cybersecurity. We're able today to address uh, or to offer CLE credits. We have We've been approved for two credit hours um, in the areas of professional practice category for New York State CLE credit. I know many of your states um, also, you can uh, you know, translate that, but you'll check your own state by state guidelines on that front. And as many of you know, who are here for CLE or also for the benefit of CLE, there will be a couple of times during the program, two times, where uh, Elizabeth Watcott from NYU will announce the CLE code that you need to record. Um, and then there'll be a form that's sent to all attendees after the event. Uh, the event is on CLE grounds, appropriate for newly admitted, as well as all you very experienced attorneys in our audience. And we also have many other non-attorneys with us today, um, since these are issues of not just law, but business strategy uh, and corporate responsibility that transcends throughout the organization. So I thank you all for joining us, um, our executives, our students, our professionals, our government folks in the audience. And I very much thank our amazing rock star uh, speakers. I will start with introducing our keynote, Carolyn Welshens, who's the Associate Director of the Division of Enforcement and the Acting Chief for the Crypto Assets and Cyber Unit at the SEC. Um, she's uh, former assistant director, has been in government service for many years, has been part of our women leaders in cybersecurity program uh, in the past as well. Carolyn, it is always fabulous to, to see you and collaborate with you. Thank you for joining us today, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Judy. I'm really happy to be here. I think this is a great event. Um, I have participated in the past, um, and so I'm really glad that it's uh, still going because I think it's really important and it's always a really interesting discussion. Um, and I'm looking forward to the panel later um, today. I'm going to give a few remarks, but I'm going to try to keep them pretty brief um, because I do think it's much more interesting uh, to have a discussion than for you all to listen to me drone on. Um, with respect to my remarks, I do have to say uh, that they reflect my views and not necessarily the, review, the views of the SEC, its commissioners, or any commission staff. Um, so I wanted to start by giving just a little bit of an overview of the SEC for anybody who might be unfamiliar and how cybersecurity fits into our role and our priorities. So the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, um, is, uh, has a three-part mission, um, and that is to protect investors to maintain the integrity of our markets, and to facilitate capital formation. Um, and I think that cybersecurity um, and the issues that it raises fits into all of those. Um, it raises questions of investor protection. It raises questions of are our markets uh, being maintained with integrity, particularly if they might be under um, cyber attacks. And also, are we facilitating capital formation? Are we being thoughtful? about the rulemaking and the guidance that we have out there, um, and are we helping companies um, and others to be the best corporate citizens that they can? Uh, because in the long run, I do think that that helps with capital formation 
one of the reasons why I think we have one of the strongest markets. We have the strongest markets in the world. Um, and I think one of those reasons is that um, we, we and market participants think about these sorts of issues. We may not always agree on what the outcome is um, and the best way to move forward, but I think having the discussion is really, really important. So when thinking about cybersecurity specifically, I, I think about um, a couple of different ways that it comes up. Um, the first is disclosures, um, so that investors can make informed decisions. And that's something we're going to talk about a lot today. Um, it's something that, that Judy mentioned um, that has come up in recent rules that the Commission proposed in March of this year uh, related to disclosures uh, by public companies um, concerning cybersecurity incidents. There's also the protection of investors at regulated entities. Not going to talk about that as much today. Um, I think this is a, a more public company focused event. Um, but the SEC does also think about policies and procedures and controls at entities like investment advisors and broker dealers. Um, the question of are investor funds being protected? So the way that this all manifests when coming from the SEC. Um, is through the Division of Enforcement, which I'm a member of, and, and that's where my uh, view is mostly going to be focused uh, today as it is on, on all other days of the year. Um, but the Division of Enforcement is not the only part of the Commission that is focused on cybersecurity. Um, we have had statements by our chairs um, over recent years about cybersecurity and how they, they think that others should be thinking about it. We've had the rulemaking um, most, most recently in March of of 2022, which we're going to spend some time talking about today. Um, but cybersecurity implicates a lot of different aspects that um, come up through the Commission. Um, it can implicate internal accounting controls, and therefore, um, you know, there's an interest by our Office of the Chief Accountant. As I mentioned before, it can implicate broker-dealers, and so our Division of Trading and Markets um, has, has a voice and thoughts to share there. So. Um, it's something that is being thought about across our organization, and that's not unique to the SEC. Um, I know that all of you and, and many companies um, might have specific areas um, that, are, that are specifically fo focused on cybersecurity, but I bet that it implicates um, and, and impacts everybody um, across, um, the SEC, or across your organization. But with respect to the Division of Enforcement, um, I'll talk about kind of where we've focused our interest. Um, and, and the first is in the formation of a cyber unit. Um, so back in 2010, coming out of the financial crisis, the D Division of Enforcement formed several specialized units with the thought that there are certain areas that could benefit from expertise by attorneys and specialists and others focusing on these aspects of the market. Um, and in 2017, we formed the first new specialized unit, and that was the cyber unit. Um, it, it had approximately 30 attorneys in multiple offices of the SEC, and we recently added to the cyber unit. Um, we're adding supervisors, we're adding attorneys, we're adding trial attorneys, and we're adding specialists and cyber uh, fraud and cybersecurity analysts. Um, because I think, like all of you, we've discovered that lawyers do not know everything, um, and it is good to have specialists um, with lots of different perspectives. There's a three-part focus in what is now called the Crypto Asset and Cyber Unit. Um, not surprisingly, with the rebranding, one of those focuses, um, and it has been all along, is on crypto assets. I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, that could be its whole other <laughs> discussion. Um, and instead, I'm going to focus on the other two um, aspects. One is the monetization of cybersecurity incidents, um, such as hacking or account intrusions. And the other is cybersecurity disclosures and controls, uh, because both of those implicate uh, public companies. So first of all, just very briefly on hacking. Um, the SEC has brought uh, several notable cases in the hacking space. Um, several years ago, um, there were threat actors who hacked into newswire services and were able to see press releases before they were distributed widely to the market. Similarly, um, a couple of years after that, there were threat actors who hacked into the SEC's own system um, where companies send in draft press releases, again, with the concept of seeing this information before it was public. Um, we charged both the hackers in both of those cases 
as well as people they had provided that material and non-public information to who traded ahead of it becoming public. So that was one of the examples I meant of looking at something before it's monetized. Um, we've also filed charges in, um, in cases where employees at companies have sought to benefit after a hacking event. So the most uh, notable of those um, might be the Equifax um, uh, case where after Equifax had been hacked, uh, we discovered that two employees there who had not been involved in the hack itself, but nevertheless learned about it before it went public, dumped their stock options, um, dumped their shares to avoid the losses that they expected were coming once the news did become public that Equifax had been a victim. Um, so those are examples of people seeking to monetize um, and, and do so through securities trading where we have a, a very vested interest in rooting that out and charging those wrongdoers. In addition, we think about public companies um, when there are cybersecurity incidents. Um, it's, we recognize that public companies are uh, usually the victims there um, in, in incidents where um, they have been hacked or otherwise the victim of something such as ransomware. Um, and so we look at though the adequacy of their disclosures about those incidents. Is it something material that investors would want to know about? And again, we're going to talk about this, I think, later in the panel discussion, um, and I'm looking forward to that. But I just wanted to set that as the, the uh, kind of put a pin in the note of, of what the FCC's interest is here. Um, if there has been a material event, is there disclosure so investors understand what's going on? Again, it's a complex judgment, and we understand we need to balance the considerations of a company trying to figure out what happened with getting accurate and timely information um, to investors. And then finally, um, just want to hit very briefly, again, on what Judy has previewed, uh, talking about recent SEC-proposed cybersecurity rules. And these are for public companies. They were proposed in March of 2022. Um, and at that point, um, it, they were open for comment. I, I glanced at the FCC's webpage, which is public today, um, to see how many uh, comments we had received from the public about these proposed rules. And I didn't count exactly, but I think it was around 100 different comment letters. So people have a lot of thoughts. Um, and the proposed rule, which could change uh, very well before the final rule, the Commission will consider the comments that are uh, received, um, and we'll put out a final version eventually, which could be very different than this proposal, um, would require issuers or public companies to do certain things, um, such as disclose information about a material cybersecurity incident within four business days after they determine that they've experienced such an event. Um, I think all of those kind of steps in there are things that we're going to talk about uh, what that might mean and how public companies might go about handling that. Um, it also would um, in, uh, set new rules for risk management strategy and governance disclosure. For example, requiring public companies to periodically disclose uh, management's role in implementing cybersecurity policies and procedures. These are all with the, the eye we take toward the view that investors um, care about material information. And cybersecurity risk, something that all of us are experiencing right now, is something that, that has become um, of, of great interest to investors. So those are the, the remarks I wanted to give to kind of set the stage of who the SEC is, how enforcement's thinking about cybersecurity, and preview some of the issues I think we'll, we'll be dis discussing on the panel today, um, and really look forward to hearing the thoughts of my fellow panelists. So thank you all very much, and Judy, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Carolyn. That was a terrific and very helpful overview. I really appreciate it. I would like to ask our panelists to join us now. And also we'll note for the audience, please feel free to send your Q&A throughout. I will do my best at monitoring the chat uh, and incorporating your questions, sometimes flagging them, sometimes just incorporating them in what we may already have to, to talk about. Um, and we'll also at the end kind of do a, a regroup on it. But if you send us your questions throughout, we'll work those into our conversation today. 
I am absolutely honored to have, uh, in addition to Carolyn, four other rock stars with us today. I'll go in alphabetical order. Um, Julie Cullivan, and I'm not going to do their bios justice, so dear speakers, please forgive me, but they are provided to the audience. It would, I want to maximize our time, but Julie Cullivan is on the board of directors of Axon, HeartFlow Inc., SETA, OpSWAT, and ADEA Security. She's the former chief technology and people officer at Forescout Technologies. And Julie also previously was the executive vice president for business operations and the CIO at FireEye. Julie and I first met earlier this year as we came together in some work with Blue Lava on saying what is going on with those SEC guidelines? What do they mean? And uh, I'm very happy to, to continue the conversation today with, with all of you. Um, we also have, uh, so uh, among the many hundred or so comments, we have some, some comments and thoughts that so we look forward to better understanding. And then um, we have Jocelyn Hunter with us today, who is the Vice President and Deputy General Counsel at the Home Depot, which after uh, that attack from early 2014, which I will tell you is one of the things I use in my teaching as an, a response done well. Um, and I'm not just saying that because if you're here, Jocelyn, I've said that for years now by comparison to many other responses. Um, so Jocelyn oversees cybersecurity and incident response in her role as deputy GC. She's also on the advisory board of the Duke Law Center for Judicial Studies and is a board member of the AB Women in Cyber as well, and a former chair of the board of directors for Atlanta History Center. So wonderful to get to collaborate with you and meet you uh, for our discussion today, Jocelyn. Thank you. Our, our next panelist uh, is Bethany Mayer, who is chair of the board um, and also chair of the compensation committee of Box Inc., chair of the safety, sustainability, and technology committee uh, for the board of directors of Sempra Agency, and a former public company president and CEO of Exia. I have the honor and privilege of knowing Bethany as a student in, and a rock star, amazing student uh, in our master's in cybersecurity risk and strategy program that we teach at NYU uh, for executives and uh, government officials and other professionals. Um, and so we first met more than a year ago. Uh, Bethany survived very well that, that year long executive ed program and graduated in May. So congratulations. And yeah. thank you, Bethany, for sharing your great wisdom with us uh, for the year of, of study and also in our lectures, our, our panel today. So welcome. Thank you. Our next panelist is Nazrin Rizai, who is a Senior Vice President, Chief Information Security Officer of Verizon. You all understand and appreciate what a big job that is as CISO uh, with the many different issues that, that uh, are required in, in keeping um, operations going and addressing information security. Uh, Nazrin is also the former member of the Board of Directors of InfoBlox, has served on the board for NYU Tandon School of Engineering uh, for our Center for Cybersecurity work. And um, Nazrin also is a former uh, Global Chief Information Security and Product Cybersecurity Officer for GE Company. Uh, and Verizon has been a longtime collaborator and uh, sponsor of some of our work at NYU Center for Cybersecurity um, from years past. And we are thrilled to have you with us as well, Nazrin. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks. So here we go. And so many things to talk about. Carolyn, thank you very much for setting, setting the stage. Um, I think if we can start with just big picture, um, I'm going to ask each of you to just share a little bit about what you see as key areas of focus and concern, you know, bringing us today. We'll, we'll talk about as much as we can, but in the short snippet. Uh, Julie, I'll start with you. Um, so I think some of what is important now has been important for quite some time, right? Um, if you think about um, the engagement and the things you want to understand as you're working with the organizations, you know, in my case, as, as a board member, it's, it's really making sure that they understand what their risk profile is and that they're protecting what's most important most, right? That they're, they're putting their energy in the right places and not spreading themselves too thin to think that they can protect against everything. 
Uh, it's making sure that they have the right plans in place should something happen. And again, that could be in the context of something happening with the Ukraine, Russia sort of conflict right now, or it could be ransomware, right? There's a, a series of things that that could be necessary to have in place to address. Um, and then I think it's it's really, do they, are they putting their energy in having the right level of visibility? Because it's more about knowing if something's happening than it is being able to prevent everything that's happening. Thank you. Jocelyn? So I think we're at an interesting point, you know, perhaps an inflection point because of some of the points that um, both Carolyn and Julie have made, you know, there has been sort of a heightened understanding of the magnitude of damage and harm that can come from cyber events over the past few years. You couple that with, you know, the efforts of the government, the SEC and other parts of the government to try to figure out what tools they have to bear to help remediate and understand the situation and protect, you know, our citizenry. And then you have uh, you know, where we are now, which is where we are trying to figure out what the new lay of the land will be with the transparency and with, you know, the way ransomware, it has developed over the past few years. So I think we're just at an inflection point and there's always a lot of learning at that time. Um, and, and I think that's uh, what we're here to, here to discuss today. Thank you. And Bethany. Sure, so, um, uh, so having been in technology for many, many years, as an operator, and then I moved into board service uh, most, you know, recently. And I would say that, and now I serve on on three public boards and two private boards. Um, I kind of have gotten on a big mission, which is part of why I decided to get a master's in uh, in cybersecurity risk and strategy. Um, and the reason for that is because even as a as a senior executive on the vendor side. And then again, as a CEO and, and moving on from there to, to board member, my concern has been, so of course, as we were, were saying, um, the incidents and the risk ha has ratcheted up over the last several years. But my concern is that board members in general may not be as, as knowledgeable about not just the technology, but the liabilities associated with what happens when an incident occurs and what to do um, as a board member, both before that incident and then following the incident to ensure that we've done the right thing for our investors and, and all our stakeholders. So for me, it, I think the, the goal and the mission is to um, kind of wave the flag and educate um, other board members to really understand here's the situation. It is very different than it was, you know, five years ago. And uh, things uh, as board members, we have to change and we have to learn and be ready um, and also ask the right questions so that we are both aware of what's happening within the company, that we know what the company is doing. And then when incidents occur, because they will, what we need to do to assure the company's protection and safety. Thank you. And Nazrin? Well, I would say I'm on my third tour of duty as a CISO of a large enterprise. And when I reflect on uh, my interaction with the executive leadership and the board five, six, seven years ago versus now, I would say the general trend for me is very positive in the sense that at the beginning, it was thought about a technology issue and boards were fearful um, to thinking they didn't know what to do with this thing called cyber. But I think over time, boards and executive leaders have taken really the uh, the responsibility of educating them, themselves to really understand not cyber as a technology, but the implication of cyber in a company's growth strategy, business development, third party, and even technology, but really in the context of risk and, and the company's overall strategy. And I see positive uh, 
um, uh, forward looking development in, in, in that area. And it's, it's exciting to be part of some of these discussion as nerve wracking is it as much time as I see so that I get ready for them, but it's really, they're asking the right set of question around the company's digital transformation, growth implication from a cyber perspective and what they're doing uh, board members and also leaders, the heads of um, the businesses to really ensure that they one, understand the capabilities of the organization with respect to cybersecurity, the interaction of the cyber organization with the business leadership to make sure that that business and technology and cyber are interlinked and also that plans exist and, and they're executed and also that they're effective. And so generally positive trend, I would say, Judy. Thank you all so much. And uh, our, so in our first question, we've covered a lot. We've got geopolitical risk, incident response, regulatory and civil liability risk, M&A business strategy, growth and uh, leadership. Let's see what we can do with that between now and 1 p.m. Can I just uh, add one thing? I, I yes. couldn't agree with you know, each, each of the panelists more. I guess the one thing that's still important to call out and I suspect is part of the reason the SEC continues to want to figure out how do we play a, a, a more important role here in terms of disclosures, et cetera, is that as much as things have, from a risk perspective, gotten worse over the last five years, some of the problems of five years ago have still not been addressed by organizations. And I just think that's an important call out. Um, and, and, you know, to Nazrin's point, look, I think executive teams and boards are getting more and more uh, a better understanding of how important this is and that the engagement that they need to provide. But at the same time, some of these fundamental basics are still not being addressed. And I just think that's that's part of probably why it's like, hey, we've got to have more uh, put more import on holding companies responsible for saying when things are happening. I would I would agree, actually, Julie. One of the things that I did within the master's program was my capstone was on should a cybersecurity expert be on a board. But more than that, you know, what what additional um, knowledge should the board have from a cybersecurity perspective? And I did surveys of board members about whether they thought a cybersecurity expert should be on the board or, you know, what were they doing about it? And it was really interesting because um, it, although people were very concerned, they weren't necessarily looking for that kind of expertise within board members. And I, I actually think that given the kinds of risks that the companies are facing, and, and we're talking large public companies, you know, it varies by how, how large the company is, but having some level of knowledge, not just mm -hmm. about the technology, but about the legality, the, all, the, all the legal issues and the liability issues, that has to be part of the knowledge of the board. So I, I agree with you. Anyways, it's, it's another topic we should talk about. And, and I know we're going to get into that a little deeper later, but there is an audience. This. I was just going to jump in and just say I wanted to agree with Julie and bring in one additional point, and that is if you look at some of the alerts from CISA um, that have come out just in the past year, and you look at what their recommendations are, the recommendations are patching. They're, they're like multi-factor authentication. They are not things, just to sort of emphasize your point, they are not things that were not issues five, seven years ago. So I yeah. just wanted to bring, yeah, bring in that point. I think that that is a great point. And a lot of the basic cybersecurity measures that, that could be uh, put in place are, are not yet or not sufficiently being done on top of the increasing levels of uh, sophistication of both how we're using the technology and how the threat actors are able to uh, infiltrate and, and cause harm to our, our systems. So with that point, uh, or uh, to that point, is that the reason we're seeing this current ratcheting up of responsibility for boards and executives, or is there, is there some other points driving that trend? Well, Nasrin? Yeah, I'll take that. I think the reality is that th th there, is, there is no way you can think of an, an entity, a business, 
anywhere in the globe without thinking about cyber because I don't know of any business that is not internet enabled. There is no way that any part of your interaction, it's not somewhere in access um, model that, that, um, that will not facilitate that. So at the end of the day, when you think about any kind of business, and, and we saw that, if you guys remember that during COVID, in such a rapid pace, businesses digitally transformed. They went online. Their, the, the, the retail operation were shut down. So they had no choice but to be fully digital. And as part of that, and if you then, Judy, you know, this map that to how bad guy attack, right? They find a way to Jocelyn's point, um, fish you and they, they exploit a vulnerability, boom, they're in and they move. Um, and so, um, so I think the, the reality of it is that we never planned for this. Like we never planned for internet be the foundation of how we interact with each other. So we are here. And the reality is that some of the basic foundational element of doing business, you would not in a retail operation do it this way, right? You would not in a brick and mortar um, expose yourself to some of these challenges, but internet wasn't designed for that. No. So now we're dealing with, uh, with an operating model with a fully digitally enabled global infrastructure where some of these basic foundational things um, of our issue, right? And the challenge is that large enterprises do this well. They decently do a good job. But the challenge is that we all use providers, whether it's a smaller third party or a small cloud providers that are part of our ecosystem. And, um, and, and the, the issue becomes that you are as strong as your weakest link. So I think bring it back to the board conversation, it's board members asking, what are you doing foundationally from a maturity perspective to be at the right level of you know, um, security, baseline security, yeah. right? And then on top of that, what are the things that are unique about our business and how do you align to that? And just not thinking about a cyber as a technology issue, but thinking about it as a business issue. Right. I'm not sure though that large companies are completely covered with with you know the base. Okay. A good example of that is Solar Winds. I mean, I'm sorry, but their password was in the open. The password was password um, for their customer service server, and so you know that was a significant company that just didn't really do what they should be doing at that time. And 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 I I mean some of the examples of, of recent attacks, the colonial pipeline attack, et cetera, those were really simple things that folks should have done that they weren't doing. And um, I, I really think that, uh, to your point, Nazareth, about the ensuring that the basics are there, the board has to be able to have enough knowledge of this stuff to be able to know whether the basics are there or not. Um, because I'm not sure that I would, I would say that many large companies have the basics. I, I, I wonder because when, when these attacks occur, you know, the, the reason why they occur is there's this wide open window and, and the window is, you know, password one, two, three. I mean, it's just, just crazy. So and the door door is completely locked and triple locked. Right, exactly. <laughs> the window's yeah. wide open. I think what I would, you know, add to this is that, you know, we talk a lot about the role that the board needs to play, and there's no question boards need to continue to to play a much bigger role here in 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 you know you know validating right that that the right plans are in place and the right fundamentals. But at the same time, same time to Nazrin's point, right, you need to be working with an executive team that also understands the you know that this can't be board. CISO, right? This th there's this very important layer, right? Because you've got a lot of executives that are under a lot of pressure, right, to either deliver new services and capabilities to end customers or to provide productivity to employees, right? And you know, there's this balance of speed, there's this balance of productivity versus security, right? And so what's what's so critical is that you've got a leadership team that you can have a business conversation with about 
weighing the risks. And there will be times when you say, hey, this is the right thing for us to do and we'll build some risk mitigation around it. But I think sometimes we forget about that executive team in the middle of this that is, is so critical, right? To having the right culture and DNA in an organization to ask those hard questions before things are deployed and decisions are made. Carolyn, from a regulatory perspective, how, how, if you can put some of this in context in terms of you know, what's been discussed, there are basic problems that we've been talking about for five, 10 years that, that still are these basic problems. There, there's uh, multi-faceted uh, issues that are coming at companies. There are the very simple breaches that occur. And then there's, there are admittedly highly sophisticated. You can have however many millions of dollars spend on cybersecurity and brilliant uh, folks at the, on the seat and still get compromised. So how, how do the regulators think about this? Uh, your thoughts on how the regulators think about this? Uh, reconciling, not having overbearing re uh, regulation and accountability, but addressing some of these things that we've been talking about for more than a decade. No, I, I think it's a really good point. I, I think that um, you see it reflected in the fact that the, the proposed rulemaking, you know, that I had mentioned, for example, it's not trying to do a one size fits all. It's not trying to do a, you must have these policies and procedures. You must have this incident response. And instead, the, the statement that accompanied the proposal talks about the fact that companies need to figure out, and this goes, I think, to the most recent point that, that Julie was making, what are their risks? Each business has a different model. You're going to have different risks because you're going to have uh, a different customer base or different information that you have or a different system. And so I think it's more about, are you thinking about what are your risks and what are you doing as a result? Um, and not with an expectation that everybody has to look the same because if you do, then you are gonna miss things. Something that works over here does not work over there. And so I think that's what it's trying to get at is not trying to impose a regime of what it must be, recognizing, I, I agree with you, it's going to happen. <laughs> like you could have the best cybersecurity in the world and something is gonna happen. Um, we get that. And so I think it's more about, did you do what was reasonable? And if something happens and it is going to be material to investors because of what your business is or, or what the incident was, did you tell them? Um, you know, did, did you take the steps to make sure that investors understand what's happening if it's something that's material? Ah, reasonable and material. We're going to spend some time on that. But first, I have a question for Jocelyn. As the corporate legal advisor, um, how does the how does the legal team ensure that the board is getting the right type and amount of information, and that the CISO team is and the legal team are sufficiently coordinated in the organization for, to help address these important issues? You know, I think one of the things that's really important as we've reached this point that I call an inflection point is there has to be a very, very close relationship between the legal cyber people and the folks, the CISO and the folks who are working on cyber. And so there needs to be a fluidity of, of conversation and of information that's flowing all of the time. And then as you move towards a board meeting, what you need to do is figure out, like uh, as others have talked about, like what is your maturity? What are you gonna present to the board about your maturity, about your assessments, about what type of tabletops you've done? What are you gonna talk about? Are you gonna inform them about what nascent risks are or current risks are? And then you come up with you know, an agenda that you can present to the board and you're looking at doing it on a regular basis because of course, this is not sort of a one and done. This is, a, is an evolving and dynamic area and it is going to continue to need to be discussed both internally with all the stakeholders and with the management team and with the board in order to be effective. And there's a, an audience question of, uh, we're going to get into some of this later, but how, how do you, um, for a board member to quickly get up to speed on cybersecurity issues? I'd say in addition to joining us today, and also, uh, you know, such as Bethany did for the, the master's degree program, what are other thoughts on how to quickly know that you're even asking the right questions? 
Well, there's a couple of resources that um, you can look into. One is uh, NACD has a program, um, uh, and, and there's another program. So the NACD program talks primarily about the basics of the technology because a lot of folks, you know, who are on boards don't really have a, a good depth of the technology. Um, and my understanding is that they're adding to it um, at the behest of some of us NACD members, um, some of the liability issues and, and the legal issues associated with it. Um, the other piece though, the other uh, organization though is called DDN, it's a digital directors network and it's run by a guy by the name of Bob Zukas, really smart guy. And he has created a, a really short program for folks that's very, very strong for um, cybersecurity, uh, it's like a cybersecurity master's class. So that those might be two good alternatives for short purposes. And then I have had a lot of folks on boards ask me about the master's program at NYU and why I took it. And um, I really feel it was hugely valuable to me. Um, and I have a very deep technology background, but um, in cybersecurity, but all the other aspects of, of cybersecurity were really important to me as well. And I felt that I didn't have the knowledge I needed to. And I feel the NYU program has a very, very strong program, both technically, as well as from a legal perspective uh, for this area for board members as well. So those are some resources you might consider. Judy, I wanted to ask to what Bethany said and <clears throat> for cyber programs where you're sitting on a board of a company, ask for actually um, for a tour or maybe one of your business visits to be a cyber visit. I've done that, not at Verizon yet, but when I was at GE, um, I would have my board members come and we'd do a full day of Fusion Center visit and we would do a full program briefing for them. I think that's, that's really key, um, a good learning opportunity. If you allow me, I wanna go back to what Jocelyn said about the board interaction. I think there is a way and there is an agreement I have with my board and I, I wanna lay it out here for you. It says with every board meeting, I'll bring three things to you and fourth one I track, but I will not bring to you. Number one is like Jocelyn said, what is the state of maturity of my program as compared with an outside assessment? And many of us, have measured. It's a common stick. It's not a certification, but it's a common stick that you can use across your program and it looks at all elements of protect, detect, respond, and recover. The second one is strategic program that we lay out annually and very specific KPIs that we bring to the board, which always are either tied to some kind of a business initiative that we don't have uh, cybersecurity risk coverage for, or general risk reduction, right? The third component is identified risk areas that we have called out that we're tackling, right? And the fourth element that I say I don't bring to you, so don't ask for it, is operational metrics. Because I think it's very confusing for a board to say, why is your patch level this versus that? It's not a board level conversation because it distracts you from really asking the more important questions, which is really for all the business uh, parts, uh, aspects of the business strategy, do I have proper cyber coverage? Are the basics covered? What are the big risk areas? And do you together with the business and executive leadership have a plan to address that? And that consistency of the three things, quarter over quarter, it's really powerful to demonstrate either progress or lack thereof to the board. Thank you. I think that's very helpful, both the what you will tell them, what you won't tell them. Some of that may vary based on the size of the company and the construct of the board um, and the board's confidence in, in leadership, you know, to, to know that someone is actually dealing with those operational questions and patching and those kinds of things, which you know, with Nazrin at the helm, you know, yes, but in other companies, it, it may be required. Uh, and that gets into an issue that's always a little bit tricky, right? When we talk about uh, boards and management is where is that line of the board as the overseers and management as operational and running the company? Uh, and 
what protections are in place to ensure that boards are doing the right thing. I'll just say quickly, um, the, the trend in cases has shown that boards need to not only ensure that there are proper controls in place, but also that they are in fact being followed. So what is the right level of follow-up and Carolyn, I'll start with you. Do, do the current proposed rules address that in terms of the disclosures on board experience and, and uh, disclosures of the company? Yeah, the, the, the current um, proposals do um, uh, propose that, that companies would need to disclose um, if any of their board members have cybersecurity experience, if, if any, um, to disclose that. Um, and then also, um, disclosures around, periodic disclosures around what is the board's oversight of cybersecurity risk. Um, you know, so again, you know, I think not trying to take a one size fits all and, and dictate what that needs to mean, but what are um, boards doing, what is their approach, um, so that investors have that kind of general information that, uh, that they can, you know, they can have in mind. I, I would also add there that, um, you know, each board's going to be a little different in terms of how they've constructed subcommittees or, you know, where maybe the next level of detail is covered. And again, not the operational metrics, because that would put everyone to sleep, but the, you know, hey, look, you know, uh, enterprise risk committee, right? You might look at specific incidents, even if they didn't rise to something that was material, right? Let's walk through this. Let's understand what we learned from this and what we're doing to mitigate against it. So I think we have to keep in mind that not all of this is just done at the full board level, right? There's certainly that engagement, but then there's often another level of engagement that I think allows you to go a little more, a little more deep on some topics. But again, it doesn't mean you're sticking your fingers in there and, and you know, digging into every operational element. Right. I would agree. I think though that one of the things that I think is important, and it, it depends on the size of the company and what the company's business is, but I really think that um, having uh, having cybersecurity risk in audit uh, could be not the right place, honestly. And the reason for that is a number of things. One, the folks who make up the audit committee oftentimes are not cybersecurity knowledgeable. And the other piece is that there are so many things that are covered in the audit committee. I, I think the, the number is something like 40, according to Lloyd Touche, that 40 um, items are covered in the audit committee. I sit on audit committees often because I'm a former public company CEO, but and I happen to have cybersecurity background, but that, that's not why I'm being asked to sit on an audit committee. I'm asked to sit on an audit committee because of my financial expertise. But um, I think putting it only in the audit committee, and, and I think it's something like 78% of companies have it only in the audit committee. I think it's not the right place for, for many companies. I think that a separate risk committee, and there are a lot of risks in the enterprise. There's right now there's supply chain risk, there's uh, customer facing risks, there's a lot of risks, systemic risk and cybersecurity is one of them that you could include in a risk committee with the appropriate oversight and the kinds of folks who, who understand different levels of risks in that committee. I, I think that would be something from a structural perspective that boards should consider going forward. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I was certainly not suggesting stick it in audit committee and think it's covered at the same time. Um, if we can bring in people with technology backgrounds, <laughs> um, even starting there is a way to raise right. the visibility to then say, hey, maybe we need to pull this out and either have a technology committee where this is covered or an enterprise risk committee. So I think that is continues to go to the, um, the idea that it'd be nice to get more cyber skilled people, technology skilled people, right? Because remember, not every risk in technology is a cyber risk, right? right. It can be a you know, just business disruption risk because of third party technologies you have embedded in these types of things. And it's being able to look kind of holistically across what some of those technology risks are beyond just just security. So excellent point. I agree. Just putting it in audit. It doesn't get its due for sure. Yeah, it, it just unfortunately. And, and I mean, not all companies can do this because the size of the board, the size of the company, that's 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 completely understandable. But when you're dealing with, you know, I don't know, Fortune 500, you should consider it. I think it's an important thing to consider. And, and there are several kinds of risks that could be covered in a risk committee. 
Julie, when you talk about bringing more people in, do you mean bringing in cybersecurity experts on the board or bringing them in to present to the board? I think I think both, but I was thinking more like as you know, organizations continue to look at that skills matrix that they need across the board, right? And as they're looking to add a new board member or replace somebody that's that's um, coming off the board, is is you want some of these skills to be part of the profile and looking across that and saying, hey, where do we have gaps? So you know, to the point that was made earlier, you know, I don't know that every company can afford to have one board seat that is just a cyber role. But if you can get somebody like Bethany, who's not just got the cyber role, she's got the CEO whisperer role, she's got the ability to talk about financials, right? Like, if you can look at like, who could bring more of this to the table? So at least we start to get that focus and engagement and visibility, and then you go from there. I, I would agree, Julie. I think that um, there are many technology executives who would fit the bill. I also think um, that um, this this just you know folks are starting to put uh, specific expertise on boards like CMO expertise, CHRO. You see the, these starting on boards for especially around ESG issues. So why not? Why not have digital transformation or a technology leader specific to either digital transformation or cybersecurity be on the board. I think that makes sense given those are two huge issues that many, maybe all companies, well, certainly all companies face from a cybersecurity expert uh, uh, perspective, but also from a digital transformation perspective. So I, I agree with you, Julie. I think that there's an opportunity here depending on the size of the board for that to be, be, be you know, part of the board makeup. Jocelyn, when you're working with an organization, uh, you know, ensuring that the board is sufficiently informed, what are some of the key points, depending on the various levels of expertise, or I should say, regardless of that, that, that you want to make sure your board is hearing from the, the legal team? From the legal team, we make sure as we came out of the breach, of course, you're reporting on all of the legal matters that flow from a, uh, a large incident and what the status of those is, the status of the matters is, uh, is at that time and what the go forward plans are. We are also reporting as an incident response team leader, I'm always reporting on you know, how we are making sure that we are primed and ready for what current threats are and what tabletops we're doing and how we're thinking about that and how we're keeping people apprised. Um, we are also reporting on things such as the SEC guidance and any other guidance that has come out that is legal in nature. So that's kind of what we do from a legal perspective that's just purely legal. And, and Nazrin, um, for a CS, CISO, a CISO, you mentioned, you know, you tell the board what you want to talk to them about what you aren't going to address. Do you have advice for, for CISOs or their advisors who feel that maybe the board isn't sufficiently prioritizing cybersecurity or isn't sufficiently informed? How, how to address that and with whom? Um, so I, I want to add to what just, Justin said. Um, again, and when I report to the board, we report it against what we call strategic lenses. There are 10 lenses that we use. Um, and then I don't report on program, don't report on technology deployment. I say, we talked about maturity. We talk about business development. What companies did we acquire? Did we um, do a security assessment? Uh, what are the major third parties and what's their posture from a security perspective? I love what Jocelyn said about um, technology and cyber defense, level of resi uh, resiliency and re uh, readiness in response um, uh, to, to um, cyber attacks. So I think, uh, Judy, it's, it's important to how to frame it, but not just for the board. The same frame is with the business leadership. So it's, and, and, and I think this is the trick. As a CISO, the fact that I'm a technologist is just table stake. What I need to do as a CISO to be successful is to lean into business and make it 
meaningful for a business leader to say, here is my cybersecurity strategy and really talking about all the components of their strategy and what, what they're doing, not what the cyber team is doing, but what they're doing. And I think boards can cross check us against each other. What I am saying, what a CEO of a business or a head of a new venture is saying, and are we saying the same thing, right? So are we all aligned in terms of what we need to do for the, bit, for the business to protect itself, to defend itself? Um, so I think that's really, really important. Right. And, and that your point really goes to the importance, too, of, of breaking down silos, right? Part of what we do for uh, the Women Leaders Program is bring together interdisciplinary perspectives and people from different roles within the organization. So we want to make sure the, the CISO is talking to the, the strategy team, is talking to the legal team, is coordinating with answering questions of the board, all in the context of what um, you know, Carolyn or other regulators might be prioritizing uh, that, that the company needs to, to worry about. Um, and, and to you, Carolyn, what, what does the SEC look for to know if the board is acting reasonably with regard to its duties? Well, again, I mean, I think it comes back to what I was talking about before. Um, and I think that's the, you know, the, the understanding of the business and what the risks are. Are they getting that information? Um, do they, you know, have they been, have they been given the information? Um, you know, are they engaged in the discussion of um, what the um, basic framework is around um, those, those risks? an understanding of who's responsible, that there is, you know, an incident response and escalation plan, um, you know, depending on the, the type of business and the risks, you know, back to Jocelyn's point about, you know, the defense. Um, so I think that, again, it's kind of hard to say, um, you know, because uh, the facts and circumstances depend, but I think looking for that engagement and looking that are they getting the information from management? Um, you know, back to the point that management's the one who's going to know the business the best. And so is it a, a flow of information in both directions, um, you know, or at least questions being asked, information being given? Um, and does that seem reasonable in light of, you know, what, what the, the company itself is facing? Right. And, and in that whole context, for, for all of our, our panelists, an audience question of if we could direct board members and executives to do any one thing to address cybersecurity risk and risk mitigation, uh, what, what would you say that would be, whether it's doing a thing or asking questions? Um, I can give my perspective. Um, I think at, at the basic level, and Masrin spoke about this with regard to what she tells her board, um, having an understanding about the uh, sort of the, the overall um, risk profile of the company at a basic level, using a metric that is not the company's, that is outside of the company's, a standard of some kind, usually it's a NIST standard. I mean, that, that's the basics of what you should initially start with a conversation with your uh, management team around to, to understand what's the breadth of their program and where are they in their cyber risk journey. So are they at the beginning? Are they kind of in the middle? or how do they benchmark against other companies? Uh, NIST provides that benchmark and then being able to then track how they go along in that journey. What are they doing against all of the, the aspects of risk They're very, or, or, or NIST? They're very straightforward. There's not, it's, it's all in plain English so that it's not a you know, weirdly technical kind of discussion. I think that's the beginning and the basics of what you have to as a board do when you say when you first join a board or when you begin to think about the cybersecurity risk associated with your company, what's the program against what standard? Where are they? How do they benchmark? And where are they going? That's my thought. Thanks. I, I would add to that, which I think is incredibly important. And I think the, 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 the place you start um, is the, the incident response escalation. Um, does the board understand when it is supposed to be informed, um, you know, based on what happened and if so, at what point in the process? Um, you know, that's obviously specific to the board, but also more generally, I think places where I've seen companies fall down is that 
um, the people who notice the stuff, which are often well below management, do they understand what they're supposed to do um, if something happens? Right. Have they been given training and do they understand who they're supposed to tell? So that it eventually does make it up to the decision makers of what, you know, what do we need to do either publicly or internally as a result. And so I think asking those questions and, and having an understanding around when are we going to be informed and more generally, what's the plan if something does happen? I agree, Carolyn. I'm on a big bent to say I, I, all my boards, I want to see your incident response plan. <laughs> I, I, I want to review it as a board member. Usually it's because of because I'm on audit committee. Um, and in one case with, with Semper, I, I run the, the Safety, Sustainability, and Technology Committee, which has cybersecurity in it. And so that review is very important because at the end of the day, and I think there was a case recently that you enforced, the SEC enforced around where the disclosure didn't get to, or the escalation didn't get to senior management. And therefore senior management didn't make disclosures um, because they didn't know, uh, I think it was the American, um, I can't remember the first American uh, case. They didn't know that there was actually an incident that had occurred. And so I totally agree with you. And it's sort of my, my, my current rant is where's the, where's the incident response plans? I wanna see it. And then I actually look at it against other, there, there are good examples of those out in the, in the market that you can take a look at. And I look at them against other companies to see how, how good they are, right? So I think that's very important. Well, I, I would just, <clears throat> I, add this, uh, I wanted to add to that too. Just, um, I think it's really important to have an incident response plan I think it's also really important to test your plan. It has to be a plan that you actually take people through on a regular basis. And then the third thing I would say about an incident response plan is that it's an evergreen. It is never completely finished. You need to be going back to that plan to make sure that it's up to date. Sorry to interrupt you, Julie, but I just wanted to get that point in since I'm an incident response team leader and mm -hmm. had to say something about it. No, excellent, excellent point. Oh, well, I was gonna go back to, to Bethany um and say the question was what's the one thing and i don't think anybody any of us think there's one so in fairness to her uh, you know i'm sure she would have said incident response right away as well but i guess what i would add to jocelyn's is um which i agree with um completely i would add that it's nice to have the assessment done from a third party and not from the internal team's perspective <laughs> of how they're doing against their peers and then the other is look it's not you look at it once it's like over time are we seeing incremental progress against the things that are either most read or most important in terms of protecting the organization that's all i wanted Great, great points. And, and the, the whole concept of incident response escalation and review are, are significant challenges. And I've seen it's not just what's in the plan, but then what actually happens in practice. Why, to, to your point, Jocelyn, the testing is, is so important. Um, I have more to say on that point, but I'm going to hold because it is time for our CLE code. Elizabeth? Yes, I'm going to display on the screen. Um, sorry, just a second. So this is our first code, CCS1685. And I'll read it again, CCS1685. All right, so if you can note that down, you'll need to submit it to receive CLE credit. All right, thank you, Judy. Bravo. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so on this challenge of incident response escalation, it goes to a lot of what we've been talking about. Are the right people in the organization talking to each other? Do they know each other? Is there a plan? Has it been tested? Has it been figured out? And what we've seen in the case law with regard to, to potential liability, this has been a question for years. I'm going back to Oh, was it about 2013 or so, the, the Palkin Homes versus Wyndham case in the District of New Jersey, where Judge Chesler looked and said the board had done enough to fulfill its fiduciary duty by having updates and briefs on not the one or the two, but the three <laughs> Wyndham briefs, uh, breaches or incidents, and having an outside person, as you recommended, Julie, and um, looking to address those and improve those. But over the last 
couple of years, we have seen out of Delaware a few cases where courts have upped the ante for boards, not just in the cybersecurity context, but one has to do with ice cream, uh, a company that had the, the court found that um, food safety was the priority of the organization and the board did not have proper controls to ensure that they were, you know, or didn't properly watch that the company had the right controls, I should say. And, and another had to do with oncology drug testing, where there were proper controls, but the failure to meet them in clinical trials did not escalate to the board. So that really paints a picture of what board responsibility and oversight uh, is, which causes some concerns about liability. And those two cases that I mentioned, the ice cream and the uh, oncology drug testing, the um, it was a shareholder derivative action in each that was able to defeat the initial motion to dismiss, which means there's still a question about whether the board is, is protected or, or could be liable for failing to meet its fiduciary duty. But when we talk about this liability landscape and the context of the challenges of incident response escalation, I wanna go back to our SEC rules where, where we started off this morning. Um, this requirement that a company needs to file an 8K within four business days of a material cybersecurity incident. And I guess level set, Jocelyn, you're the incident responder uh, point of contact for, for your major organization. Can you just say a word? Incident response isn't easy. Tell, tell us about the, the, the speed and the, the challenges of that just real in a nutshell. Well, I think everybody here understands that, you know, any sort of incident is dynamic. And um, in the initial stages, you do not necessarily understand what has happened, how it's happened, what the magnitude of it is, what the risk is. And during the pendency of particularly the early stages of your, of your investigation, thoughts about those issues may continue to evolve and change, and you may completely end up in a different place than you started. So, you know, early on in incident response, you are trying to get information, but you need that information to be accurate, and that just takes time. And so that, you know, with the four days and materiality is the place where you've heard a lot of commentary about the challenge with that particular rule. Thank you. And, thank you. and uh, Carolyn, can you explain for us a little background on the purpose or the goal of this proposed rule? Sure, and, and again, from my perspective, um, you know, I think we've heard a little flavor of this today um, you know, I think there are some companies that are getting it right, and there are some that don't. Um, and the ones that get it right, you don't normally hear about from us um, <laughs> and because they got it right. Um, but I, I think it's an effort to try to level the, the playing field a little bit more um, and encourage more disclosure with the understanding. And I, I agree with Jocelyn, like, you're not going to know all of that stuff um, in the first, you know, few hours. You may not have it all figured out in the first few days. Um, but once the company's made a determination that this is material, then um, that is something that we say needs to be shared with investors. Because I think the concern is that companies that realize they've got a problem and they delay telling investors because they are either in good faith trying to figure out every last detail so the entire thing can be presented at once um, but in the meantime, investors don't know that there's been a problem and that might impact their investment decisions. Or the worst case scenario is in you know, bad faith, um, using that as an excuse to not share. Um, and so I think it's trying to balance all of those considerations. And that's why it's not a hard and fast, you must disclose within four days of an incident. It's the, the company making the determination that it's material. And I, I know that there are trade-offs to that not being a hard and fast rule that is perhaps easier to follow, but I think it's trying to balance not saying you have to deluge the market with everything if you have made a determination that it's not material um, or you haven't reached that decision yet. But once you get there, then that's something that investors uh, need to know about, even if it is with caveats that we're still figuring this out or we might update in the future or, or you know conditions could change. 
So I, I think one of the, the concerns that's come up around this is, and you guys have addressed them very well, but it's, it, and this is a bit more of maybe a, a technology perspective than a retail perspective or, or other industry. But, you know, I feel like, you know, somebody made the comment early on, I think it was Judith about, um, you know, a, a res, an example of a response done well. And I feel like, um, or I should say conversations I've been in have raised the potential risk that companies that have also responded well have responded early to their customers and partners if they believe there's potential risk, but yet the investigation is not thorough, the impacts aren't understood. And one of the concerns I've heard raised is, will that, will companies hold back on some of that early communication that is often vague at best, but it's at least, hey, you're important to me, you may have been impacted, I care about you. Um, and I've seen technology companies get attacked for not doing this type of thing. Concern being, will people hold back because they're worried that that early communication would be a signal too soon uh, when when all the materiality and, and other things aren't understood? And, and I do feel like in, in that, you know, like it's really important that companies are are open and transparent with their customers, partners, employees, but often you don't know much early on, but you do know you want people to know. And, yeah. and really what you just said is so critical because it's it's establishing a pattern among CISOs. I deal with incidents day in, day out. It's becoming a really good practice. Like you get on the call and says, here is what I know, but it could change tomorrow. It's a comfort. It says, what are you seeing? What are the indicators of compromise? Can you share what you got? Knowing that tomorrow I'll say something different to you, but it's becoming a known practice and an element of partnership is, tell me what you know today because tomorrow I know it will change. It might change. And, and it there is a possibility that it this kind of a bounded time window can have, um, um, unforeseen consequences as a result of this, this path that we're all on, whether private or public partnership in terms of sharing uh, and with the, the ultimate goal of really protecting all of us, right? Mm -hmm. Protecting nations uh, as a whole. So I totally see what you're saying because it's a good pattern that being established um, a lot of times when, when a third party of mine um, doesn't share something with me and say, like, go, talk, go talk to so-and-so, I can't tell you this, I go, that's not a partnership. Tell me what you know, because my network was open to you. So those are the kind of conversation that, that could be impacted as a result. I, I would agree, Nazrin. I think too that, um, you know, within a four day window, it is really hard to know what's going to be material. Usually you find a very small thing going on in some part of your network or with an individual or with a, a specific device. And so to understand, I mean, so, so do you disclose that or not? Because that at that point really isn't material. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and so if you make a mistake, then what happens, right? Because then essentially you haven't disclosed because you don't believe it's material at that time. It, it just takes more than that amount of time to really, in, in many cases, maybe not all cases, but to understand whether or not an incident is material because it, it rolls out over such a, a you know period of time that, okay, this happened. Okay, they moved sideways and now they're over here. And you know, this is months later that you figure that out. Anyways, I it's a very this is a very difficult uh, area to really get a good uh, read on in terms of what you should be doing and how you should disclose. And, and I'd be curious Jocelyn's comments on this as well. What are your thoughts, Jocelyn? I agree entirely. I mean, I think it's uh, you know the beginning of an incident isn't a challenging time as everybody has outlined. There's just a lot of unknowns and you are head down trying to get the facts, trying to understand what has happened. And depending on the nature of the incident, that could take a short time, that could take a long time. 
And I think the proposed rule suggests that you do it within four days of determining materiality. I think the challenge is, and maybe the concern is what you alluded to, Bethany, which is, you know, are you going to be second guessed? Like you determined it was material on today and it's 7 12, but then, and you disclose four days from now, but then people look at it and say, well, you had this fact, you know, five days previously and you should have disclosed earlier. And I think it, it's just a really challenging time. And it's also a time when there are a lot of hands on deck. And this would be an extra sort of uh, add to what you're trying to do. And so um, that that's challenging to sort of uh, completely understand and think materiality is the, the right place um, to land for uh, you know, what you sh should disclose. But I think there are some challenges around the timing. Um, there are challenges, ar challenges around whether you could be second guest. And I think there are some challenges uh, relating to whether or not um, you really know at that moment that there is going to be some sort of actual harm. Because um, I think the way the rule is drafted at this time, it sort of contemplates, you know, potential harm, not actual harm. So, right. you know, I think there, there are, are, are some areas there that there's been a lot of commentary on um, that, you know, others have alluded to as well. How about the concern that you determine its material, and I want to ask what that even means in a moment, but you determine its material, and then for biz within four business days, you let investors know, but systems may not be patched by then, you may not have informed all your stakeholders, they may not have had a chance to patch their systems. How do you navigate that or balance those concerns with the public it's filing? Yeah, it's challenging. I mean, because you you really um, could be at a juncture where there are you know different timelines that you're trying to adhere to as a company. There are the timelines you know in this proposed rule. There are data you know sort of uh, notification uh, timelines that you had have to adhere to if certain you know data has been exposed, and those could be different. You know, you may be working with law enforcement, and depending on the nature of the event, they may really not want you to uh, make disclosures so that they can uh, do their work. There, there are challenges abound around this. But it, it's, a, it's a difficult time just overall. And I certainly am um, uh, think that the idea of materiality is the place that we need to land. But I think some of the timing around it and, um, and, and all, you know, most of the commentary has commented on, on all of these issues. And, and what are some of the considerations for determining materiality? So materiality, I mean, I can pass it over to Carolyn if she wants to take it first uh, for, for, for the SEC. But before I do that, one thing, sort of my thoughts here are sort of my thoughts, not speaking on behalf of Home Depot about the rule itself. Did you want to take sorry, that one, Carolyn? Yeah, no, it. sorry. Yeah. No, sorry. I hit the wrong button. Um, yeah, no, I'll, I'll be really interested in your thoughts. I mean, I would just say, like, stepping back a moment, thinking about materiality, not even necessarily just tied to this proposed rule, but also thinking about like other statements like that, like our chair made about cybersecurity and disclosures in the 2018 timeframe. Um, I, I don't think of it in terms of like a quantitative metric. Um, I, I think it, you want to move away from that. And it, and it again, it, it kind of goes back to what the company is and what its business model is. So, you know, we're talking about potential harm that could be a range of things. You know, that could that could be financial performance. Um, it could be reputational. Um, it's going to tie back also to um, the nature of what happened. You know, the 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 known extent scope at the time. Um, what information might have been impacted? Um, you know, if it, if it was a question of compromised information, um, the impact on the the company's operations. Those are all some of the different factors that might weigh in, and it's it's going to be facts and circumstances. It's going to depend on the particular incident and the particular company, um, mm -hmm. and, and you know making that determination. But Jocelyn, I'm really interested in your thoughts. Um, Carolyn, I, I have a quick question for okay. you. Yep. Um, just so sorry. Uh, so my question is, if the if materiality doesn't depend on just financials. What would you say, and, and Jocelyn, you, you may have the answer for this. I'm sure you do have the answer for this as well. 
So what kind of group of folks would you gather together to decide on materiality? Because I'm assuming it's your auditors, but it would also be, you know, if it's reputational or if it's like customer facing or something, it would be some other set of experts within and outside of the company that you would you would talk to. How would you either Jocelyn or Carolyn, what would you what 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 are your thoughts about that? Who who would you go to to determine then if materiality isn't strictly financial, then what kind of team would you put together to determine materiality? Jocelyn, do you want to take that? Okay, yeah, sure. Um, so I think historically, I'm going to just take a step back. The definition of materiality has been, you know, sort of with the investor lens on, and it is the lens of what would an investor think would be important with respect to an investment decision. Um, and so that's sort of the lens on it. And if, you know, the information itself would have changed the character of the total mix of information out about that company at the time. So those are sort of the legal rubrics of, of, of the definition. And then I would say with respect to how you make the decision, you know, it's going to depend on the company because each company is going to be different. It's qualitative and quantitative. Um, and you've got to, you know, really sit down and understand your company, its risk profile and uh, figure out whether or not that's going to be material for you. So it's kind of hard to really say other than in this instance, I would say definitely you're going to want your CFO involved. Definitely you're going to have your CISO involved if it is a cyber uh, issue. Definitely, you know, you probably want your incident response uh, team person involved. You want your general counsel involved. You want your CEO involved. I would say, you know, beyond that, you would then want to, you know, have some internal discussion and there may be other internal stakeholders in that conversation, depending upon your business and maybe even dependent upon the type of incident. But then you would also want to have that conversation with your auditors. That's sort of how I think about it generally. I think what Jocelyn said, two, two things. One, materi materiality, easy for me to say, is um, it's tied to a company and their business model. So you can't have one size fits all. And the second element I would introduce, which, which is, makes it hard and tricky, is not, it's not just financial term. It's not just reputational terms. It really depends, right? Like a lot of times we look at things that happen in terms of financials or even customer impact might be very small. But if there is a large scale social media pickup, you want to jump on that, you know, because that could very quickly become something that in financial terms doesn't make sense. Neither does in customer or customer notification, but reputationally it's getting out of hand. So that's why it's really company specific in my mind. The thing I would just add um, is you, you know, I, I think in any incident response, right, you're going to have some sort of communications element as well. And, you know, in this case, right, it might be less general communication and more investor relation type, right? Like there might be some additional element there that you want to bring in to make sure that that, that piece is covered appropriately perhaps not to determine materiality, but to make sure that there's the right plan that I think may go beyond what a traditional response might be. Um, but slightly different um, topic, you know, again, and this is a proposal, it's not final, right? But, you know, for me, it's like when I see terms like, hey, there's been a violation of a policy. Wow. Um, that's, that it depends. And again, there's usually an investigation to figure out if that violation actually created any liability or risk. And, and, you know, ideally many times it has not, right. It's an opportunity to train more. It's an opportunity to put in some better controls. So I think to that point about, you know, potential harm or actual harm is where it gets really tricky. And so I think about, they talk about any policy violations, but then they also talk about a series of small violations that in aggregate could equal. And again, this is where I think that leaves a lot <laughs> uh, you know, of open-endedness that um, I think ideally there'd be a little more specifics around. Um, and again, I know this is an art, not a science, right? You mentioned this is not just a you know, quantitative thing, but I feel like those couple of areas could end up in this that's a lot of AKs, right? Like that really had no material impact, but you're not quite sure. 
I and I think one it, question sorry. is if go ahead. I, I want to close with one one idea back to lean into something, lean into your investors. Like investors are human beings. <laughs> And one of the things that I've done in the past year, I've actually done sessions for investors. Uh, a lot of times it's not about a number or one report um, with our insurance providers, with our investors. Do they understand your business and how you protect it from a cyber perspective and some of the cyber risk issues? So I think leaning into ensuring that they understand your risk profile from a cybersecurity perspective. I did the beginning of this year, a three hour session, hundreds of our investors showed up. So I think that's another way for board member to think about educating investors for that one major issue or incident day, I should say. There may be a, a questions of materiality from an incident response perspective versus from an investor perspective. There, there could be differences there, but what of the concern of an event, let's say that is very material, otherwise wouldn't it trigger a disclosure obligation within four days? Um, but the the gaping hole of vulnerability has not yet been addressed for the company and for its uh, third parties or vendors or others. Um, is there is there a way to discuss that or to and for Jocelyn's point, for example, if it's an ongoing law enforcement investigation where it might be better not to file an 8K? There has to be some provisions for that. Right there, I mean, a lot of board members that I've spoken to about this particular topic are concerned that it basically flags that you're in distress from a, a cyber perspective and that the, that it could invite more attacks. That That is a discussion that's being had out there in the world of board members. And that that is a an issue because, you know, it takes a period of time to, to um, to resolve, uh, you know, a cyber incident, and sometimes to to patch or to change your network or to restructure a firewall, that doesn't it doesn't happen overnight. So um, that that is a concern for folks from you know all the discussions that I've been in. Carolyn, what, what I would say there, yeah, and just stepping back from the again the proposed rule itself because I'm not sure um, where where it might land exactly, um, but. What I've talked to people about in the past is that if there's a question, um, I, I think that the, the the benefits and I can understand why there's a view there may, there might be um, some uh, some risks there. But I think the benefits to letting um, the FCC know if you are a public facing company far outweigh trying to not do so. Um, because the, the chances are that we're going to hear about it anyways, whether because there's a leak and it becomes public you ultimately disclose it. Um, we hear about it from our other law enforcement partners. There could be a whistleblower. Um, and I just think generally having that dialogue and giving us the opportunity to hear what you don't know, what you're working on, why you might have particular concerns in that particular situation of we disclose this because of where it is in the network or because we don't know yet where it is, these are the risks. Um, give us the opportunity to have that discussion um, and see where we are. Again, I can't weigh in on where the, the rules might be and what flexibility there might be in there or not. But I think um, reaching out and having that discussion, companies do that. And again, I'll come back to, we've only brought a very small handful of disclosure cases uh, for cybersecurity events, especially when you consider the vast number um, that there are. And so that would be my plea um, of, of share that information with us and share what you're thinking. So we have the benefit of, of having that in mind. And, and so that's, a, I guess, a difference of letting the SEC or other regulators that may oversee the, the company know is one bucket we could talk about, but then the, the public filing for an 8K um, is, a, is a completely different beast, I'd say. Um, and, and of course, this goes back to balancing, you know, disclosure and transparency and, you know, at the, uh, with the ability to effectively handle an incident by not curbing a company's response, as Julie was saying earlier, 
to be concerned to tell stakeholders at risk that it may be then deem it material, uh, which could hinder cybersecurity or exposing the vulnerability, which could hinder cybersecurity. Uh, but back to, to Bethany's point about the concern of revealing the weaknesses. Um, the other area of the proposed rule that has to do with disclosures on policies and procedures to identify and manage cybersecurity risk is that one, a risk of showing who the softest targets are, or two, a call to get up to speed on those things we've been talking about for 10 years that haven't been fixed yet uh, by helping to level set things, three, something else, or four, all of the above. What, what are your thoughts on, on, uh, on that, team? Julie, you. you want to take that? Oh, Nasrin, I didn't see your. Uh, I, I was uh, I was wondering. I was processing your question. Is it all the above? Yes, I think it's all the above. <laughs> it was a compound <laughs> question. Terrible <laughs> question, but yes, go ahead. I, I think the the timing matters. Complexity of what you're dealing with matters. Who you have in that ecosystem matters, and early visibility might trigger situation when the threat actors go from one place to the other. All of those things matter. Um, I think we're all, I hope we're all in agreement that uh, making sure that, that when you have determined materiality and incident occurred, and that you take care of your customers, you take care of uh, notifying them in a timely fashion, and you adhere to the regulatory ruling that you're working with. Key is what are the boundaries of that? Who determines that? And, and would that be sufficient or would it improve cybersecurity in the way that we're all envisioning? I think it's also all of the above. And, and I agree with Carolyn's point on, you know, reaching out to the SEC just even if you aren't sure what is happening yet, uh, I just uh, I think preemptively doing that is is a good thing to do, uh, along with other um, you know other folks in the in the legal community um, uh, and in law enforcement. Um, so I I do think it's an all of the above kind of answer and problem, um, but I I think taking preemptive action. Um, you know, when you aren't sure, but you think it's going to go there, um, I think that's helpful, uh, you know, from a, from a, um, both a investor perspective, as well as company integrity and, um, ensuring that you have, um, you, you've made sure that you're going to inform transparency fast as you can in the, in the, in the highest integrity manner. Um, you know, as much information as you have. So I, I think that I think that would be my answer. And, and I've heard from multiple regulators about uh, sort of, and there, and there has been a, a significant benefit sometimes of, of coming forward and having transparency uh, to, with a heads up, a courtesy so that it doesn't come out, you know, in the wrong way or sideways. Um, and building that trust can be helpful. The flip side of it that I have also uh, come to, heard, uh, we'll say, is if a regulator then gets too much in the business of distracting from the actual response itself. So early notice is good, but balancing that with let's let's stop the the bleeding, and then we can deal with sort of the clean up on a, on a regulatory perspective. But I think that that's another tension. And in that tension, Jocelyn, what are some of the, the, the pri, um, privilege concerns as well that companies should be taking into account? You know, um, uh, privilege is, a, is an interesting uh, legal concept at this time overall. Privilege is being challenged, not just as it relates to cybersecurity, but sort of at large. And as it relates to cybersecurity, certainly if you are um, giving information that would otherwise be privileged to folks that would not be covered by the privilege, then you have the, um, the risk that you're going to uh, ruin the privilege and you're not going to have it. 
Now, one of the things that's important to always note is that facts are not privileged. So if you are giving some sort of factual recitation, then that would not be privileged anyway. So I think what you have to do is really um, think about uh, very carefully as you're walking through an incident and uh, walking through what sort of disclosures you would make to anyone at that point, like what the privilege is, what privilege you need, where you need to be uh, transparent. And in all of that, you're really, you don't want sort of the privilege issue to uh, overtake the fact that you're trying to be responsive to uh, to your customers and to your other stakeholders. And that really has to be the linchpin. And you're working within that to make sure you're defending the company as well as you possibly can. But I think you want to make sure that you, your value proposition is set up in the correct way so that when you assess it, you come out at the right place uh, with respect to that. I would agree. I think you got to be careful that privilege isn't like the tail wagging the dog. I mean, yeah. you know, <laughs> you want to do the right thing. And, um, and of course, my GC is still my best friend, um, my former GC uh, and my personal counsel. Um, and so but you also want to do the right thing and you want to be as transparent as you can be and, you know, really support and, and help your customer base, your investors, and also the legal, you know, the, the, the regulatory um, bodies that really, you know, you, you, need to, you need to inform and you need to have a conversation with. So I agree with you, Jocelyn, very much. I wholeheartedly agree. Is there a concern that the ratcheting up of, of regulatory risk could erode the, the business judgment rule that has long uh, protected directors um, that essentially assumes unless proved otherwise management is acting in the interests of the company and its and its shareholders and um, will make you know optimal decisions you know informed and, and appropriate decisions for the company is there a concern that as we move into a heavier and heavier regulatory landscape, we're, we're losing some of those protections. Bethany? Yeah, it's, I mean, I guess that could be a concern, um, but I, I don't know. I mean, you are always, you always have to assure that you know, you're, there's a, always a bright line and you've got to stay away from the bright line. You've got to, you've got to stay, you know, in the place where you're trying to focus on doing the best thing for your your company, for your investors, and your your customer base, and, and the stakeholders that you know you truly value, and and assure that the reputation and the intrinsic value of the company you know continues forward. So I I don't know. I don't think that. I mean, I I work in regulated environments today with you know working on the Semper board. It's highly regulated because it's a utility-based company. And I think, you know, they do an excellent job uh, being and what's known as an IOU, which is a, you know, a, an investor-based company, while also being in a highly regulated environment. So I, I don't know if I'm answering the question very well, but um, I, I don't think that, I think that in, in, in this case, regulation is going in the right direction. I think there's a lot of discussion and debate about precisely how it's going to turn out. But um, I think that given the risks associated with what we're facing, the regulation is necessary and appropriate uh, because in some cases, these, these, um, these attacks that have occurred, you know, have affected us so deeply and could affect us even more so, like affect our way of life. So, so I'm okay with, more regulation in this area. Did I, I hope I answered your question, but. Yes, I, I like, so we wanna steer clear of, of that bright line of, of wrongdoing. And I, and I think a lot of what we've talked about today makes it clear that directors need to be asking good questions, right? To make sure that they're properly overseeing the, the uh, companies. And then what I, I guess what a word that came up earlier, I believe it was Julie said, 
reasonable, right? We need reasonable regulatory uh, guidance. Um, and, and there is a question from one of our cybersecurity experts in the audience today who is asking how companies should manage the, uh, in, in these words, the, the seemingly regulatory arms race uh, to get more specific cybersecurity requirements, right? And again, that touches on this balance of do we want specific detailed requirements like what the New York DFS has done, or is it better with more standards like we have from NIST and ensuring companies are following NIST? And one, how should companies navigate that? And two, where is, where is that going? Um, Nazrin, I'll ask you from the CISO perspective, and then I'll ask our other panelists to weigh in on that one. Very good question. It's utterly complex environment we deal with, um, state, federal, different agencies and uh, I was part of a nonprofit organization and we made an attempt to map all these different standards for commonality and response perspective. It became so overwhelming, just the burden of all the different regulatory and controls and standards. And then add to that, if you deliver certain services to um, Department of Defense or public sector, then you got a whole bunch of additional regulatory. And I always go back to what I call kind of the cybersecurity poverty line. Companies in the top 100, 500, Jocelyn and I will just make it happen. Meaning we, our business is so critical and so tied into doing cyber or regulatory right will invest. What I worry about are companies that are in our ecosystem, but they're below poverty line from a cyber perspective, meaning they either have to get a product out or they have to do all these regulatory and standards. And I think what we're impacting as a result of in complexity, lack of clarity, or different agencies having their own set of regulatory, it's making the impact on those smaller players. And it's a balance of doing security right, or doing compliance, or doing innovation. We kind of need to strike the right balance there. And I think that's where it's hitting us. Yeah, I would agree. I think it depends on obviously the size of the company in terms of how much regulation should apply. But I think there does need to, and kind of what I was trying to say before, there needs to be a baseline of regulation in this area. And frankly, cyber, cyber crime and cyber incidents, it's been the wild, wild west for quite a long time. I mean, the nation states that we face here that are, are causing these, that are creating these attacks and their affiliates, not necessarily always them, but their affiliates, they are, this is a no holds barred situation, right? And so to kind of think about these companies that are mid cap size companies, which was my company, right? And our ability to sort of face this stuff, it was like, are you kidding? You know, I mean, we're, 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 we, we don't have the resources to do it. But at the same time, I think it's really important that um, there's some guidance given to companies and some level of standard for them to come up to. And, and, and it doesn't have to be, I mean, you know, it could end up being overbearing. I hope that won't be the case, but it has to be some minimum because it's those kinds of companies that have ended up causing serious damage in the market. Um, you know, SolarWinds is a good example, not a very big company. But the kind of attack that occurred there and, you know, the impact of it was massive, massive. So there has to be some level of it. And the issue, of course, is how much at what size and what kind of company and um, how can we create some sort of minimal standard that folks can apply so that, you know, we know there's some level of security in these companies. A positive example, Judy, of um, this private-public partnership is the effort that CISA put forth this past year in pulling together enterprises, different sized companies, telecom, cloud, and in really not talking standards and regulatory, but really talking partnerships and how to take different set of crisis and making information and approaches available to small, medium-sized players. And we really exercised that very well with the Russia-Ukraine crisis and also with Log4j, which was another solar wind-like 
um, an open source vulnerability that pervasively used in many of our systems and third party. And, and the net effect of that was that a lot of small, medium, and even large enterprises came to CISA website and they got their checklist. These are the things you got to do. Here is what we learned from other cloud providers. Here is what telecom said to us, go do it. And I think that's huge value that bring us above that poverty line in ways that standards and controls potentially don't. And I, mean, I, I think I would just add that I couldn't agree more. I think, um, you know, we need to have some baseline set of expectations and, and requirements. Um, but again, we don't want it to turn into a compliance type <laughs> approach, right? Where you're checking boxes as opposed to really thinking strategically like Nazarin has talked about in terms of what are the really big risks to the organization and how do we balance innovation with these things, right? So it's, it's, it's just making sure that people or companies and organizations don't approach this as a compliance activity, uh, but it's as a, hey, like who are we as an organization and how do we wanna be transparent with our customers, partners and, and our investors, right? In terms of how well we're, we're protecting the organization. Let's talk a little bit on the, the geopolitical uh, tensions though and their implications on cybersecurity. Bethany, Bethany mentioned solar winds, which was, yeah, devastating at the end of 2020 and into early 2021 um, from attributed to Russia, the significant Microsoft breaches, including uh, from China in 2021. And then uh, you know, the, the current Russia invasion of Ukraine. What kind of implications do those types of um, incidents and, and geopolitical events have on cybersecurity for an organization and more specifically, um, Jocelyn, I'll ask you, what are boards asking or what should they be asking about these types of developments in the context of their responsibilities? You know, I think that um, they have to ask if you're ready. I mean, you know, if you are sort of making sure that you are looking at what is coming out from the government and if you've done the activities that they suggest that are protective, they're asking if you're ready for you know, a ransomware attack, if you are ready to actually contact somebody to do your negotiations, do you have a business continuity plan? What will you do if certain systems that are critical to your business are down? How are you going to manage? Like, are you going to have to pay? Like, do you have resiliency? Do you test your backups? All of these types of questions, you know, they need to ask to make sure that you are prepared. But, you know, that is through the lens of oversight and making sure you have the appropriate procedures, processes, and controls in place to try to mitigate against some of these types of attacks. I would, I would agree. I think that's I, I think that's very important. And, and back to Nasrin's point on the CISA, on the CISA um, uh, public-private um, sort of connection there, um, they've been very helpful in this area. And particularly if you are uh, considered critical infrastructure, um, and what to do, and, and also the, the, the amount of discussion between the FBI and CISA and the you know, companies, it has, has gotten quite, quite high. Um, and it really helps in order for uh, folks to be prepared. And from a board level, I would also agree with Jocelyn that the, the question is, you know, are, how prepared are you? What are you doing? What specific things have you been uh, looking at what are you doing about disaster recovery? So there are several um, areas that you can talk about as a board just related to what's happening with uh, with Russia and Ukraine. And Carolyn, turning to the the m a context, what um, what role should cybersecurity have as to as to m a both from a security perspective and also from an insider trading perspective? Yeah, I mean, I, I... I think um, with all the talk we've had today about materiality, um, I think it's a really good point because I think what might someone consider to be material um, information, I think can extend to have you had a cybersecurity breach, like what I talked about at the beginning with Equifax, but it's also something that if um, uh, co two companies are in discussions about a potential merger, I would assume that as part of that due diligence, there's discussion around um, cybersecurity incidents, response, all of that, um, and to the extent that any of that is information that if it got out 
um, could have an impact on the company, then that's something that, again, could be considered, you know, material non-public information that someone might, you know, try to trade ahead of. And so I think it goes back to that companies should be thinking about, on top of everything else <laughs> um, that we've said today, um, do you have training around um, insider trading um, within your company? Um, you know, do you have training so that people understand um, what they can and cannot do, what is and is not considered potentially material non-public information? Um, because we do see that, that, that you do get um, employees sometimes who, who, you know, go against their better judgment and, and try to make some money um, off of something. And so I think that that's another facet, and, and the, the SEC's talked about this before, including in the chair statement of 2018, of thinking about that as sort of an attendant additional risk when you're thinking about cybersecurity. And uh, switching gears quickly, but Nazrin, what, um, given the very high burnout rate among CISOs and cybersecurity incident responders uh, in organizations, how can companies recruit and train and develop uh, a good cybersecurity team and workforce? And what other resources might be available to think outside the box with regard to that? Very good question. And I, and I know many of you know stats about this is that I don't think universities are um, uh, producing enough graduates for, uh, for just the sheer number of uh, folks that we need to cover cybersecurity. Um, so I think a lot of companies and my company Verizon included are getting creative. We no longer think about a four-year degree as an entry point into cyber. We talk about higher within, um, how to train individuals inside the company who want to make a career change. Uh, something um, new that we are piloting and I'm hoping to grow um, shortly is this concept of a cyber reserve army. So think of when you have incident after incident and you want to be precise and you want to do the right thing but your people are just so tired and fatigue has hit. So why not have a reserve army that comes in and out during those high volume, high issue incident? And we're I'm actually very excited about it because it's an opportunity to train individuals uh, inside the business and they can go back to what they're doing, but for a period of time, they join us and they can support an incident. There are also a ton of training. It doesn't have to be expensive. And many institutions have actually created curriculums around cybersecurity and does not need to be university-based. That really brings up levels, the level of security, cybersecurity training inside the organization. And part of it, it does require for, especially in large enterprises, to partner with HR and say the rules have changed. Uh, in some requirements for certain roles uh, don't necessarily make sense if we are to attract the right set of people. Because to me, you can be a good cyber person if you're curious and you're analytical. That's all I want. I, I'd like to add to that. I, I think um, I wholeheartedly agree on the need for a four-year cyber degree is just not not something that's going to get us where we need to get in terms of, of filling these critical roles. And to your point, it's somebody that's eager, works hard, analytical, you know, has that intellectual curiosity, and they don't even necessarily need to be technical per se. Um, I also think there's so many other roles in the program around audit compliance and other types of, of backgrounds that can can bring tremendous value. And I will say my experience has been in some of the CISOs that I've worked with that they often struggle with this idea of, oh, they're not a senior this, or they haven't done this before. And it's really sort of the work that you're doing, Nazrin, to change that mindset of, hey, you know, somebody that was really good on service desk that, that showed all the other attributes, why not give them the shot, right? Um, and, you know, it's great for their career. It's great for the company. So I just think it's being a little more open-minded to, you know, looking at the roles differently um, because it, it, it's not going to change. Now, I also think there's some 
bigger macro things going on in terms of CS degrees and, and, you know, people being interested in these topics more generally because of there's so many other distractions in the world right now for our young people. So I think there's some macro things going on at well, as well that, that we need to recognize as a society, we need to go work on um, and encourage people to look at these as career opportunities. Thank you. I think um, actually Erin O'Brien from NYU is here and was going to pop in and, and say a couple of words and then we have our CLE code coming up too. So welcome Erin. Hi. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for your time today, for the attendees and for the panelists. Such a great discussion. I think you just described the admissions requirements for this <laughs> program. Eager, hardworking, and analytical. That, that's pretty much what we're looking for. Um, just a quick uh, overview of this program for anybody who's interested in learning more, please don't hesitate to contact us. We'll send you some more information after the, after the meeting today. Um, this is the first of its kind program, at least that we're aware of, um, that, that's designed just like this, which is law and engineering joint degree, a one year new kind of master's management program. So a lot of folks who end up in the program were maybe looking at MBAs as an alternative more than a traditional law school or an engineering program. It's one year uh, low residency. So students come on campus for one week a semester and the rest is held in this format in the evenings, uh, New York time. I wanna give a special call out that we have extensive scholarships for eligible veterans. NYU has a 100% matching program. So many of the, the veterans in the program um, can attend the program for a little out of pocket if they're if they're eligible under the GI Bill. I will say the VA determines eligibility, unfortunately not NYU, but we match it up to 100%, which is unique. Most schools have a, a cap of something like 10 or $20,000. Um, the admissions requirement is, is sort of very similar to what you said. We're not looking for just engineers, though about a half of the students have a computer science or engineering background. We're proud to have Bethany as one of our alumni in the program and Judy as one of our fearless um, and dynamic faculty members. Judy teaches incident response and cybercrime in the program. So you can imagine how, how great those classes are. Um, Elizabeth, if you'd switch to the next slide, I'll go through a little bit who's in the room. Um, the average age of the participant is early 40s. So it's, it's not your traditional MBA. Um, we're very happy that close to half of the students have been women, which doesn't reflect the, the professional market. So we're, we're happy that we've done such a good job of recruiting women. And there's one reason for that. It's called Judy. Um, for, and we also have a close to, in some years, half the students are veterans, but this year it was a third. These are the organizations that we've had over the past couple of years. Um, notice the seals at the bottom. There's always a big representation from both the public and private sector, the intelligence community. No industry is dominant. Um, financial services, tech firm, critical infrastructure, healthcare. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out. If you're not sure if you're right for the program, reach out anyway, and we will uh, give you guidance on what might be a better fit if this isn't a fit. And for those of you in a position to identify talent in your organization or promote women or veterans, please, uh, we'd be grateful if you'd share the word. It's, it's a new program and a new kind of program, a new category of program. So we're kind of building its reputation from scratch and we'd be grateful for your help toward that. Thanks so much. It's Thank an amazing, you, Aaron. Program. amazing program. Thank you. Elizabeth? Right, so I'm going to, sorry, just a second. I'm going to share the second CLE code. Um, so the second CLE code is CCS2908. Again, that's CCS2908. Um, thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Oh my goodness, we only have two minutes left, if that. Um, we're gonna have to do another program on this whole set of questions that I have for you all, which is you, you're uh, amazing women with fantastic and impressive careers. 
How did you get there? What advice do you have for the audience? How does someone become a, a board member, advance within the legal team, their CISO team, their board, uh, and high-level government positions and supervisory roles? So all of that is going to have to come up in the fall in another program uh, for the women leaders in cybersecurity. And right now, in the last minutes, though, for each of you, if you can just give a a bit of advice for the audience, either from from a career, quick career, and quick uh, what we've been talking about today, Nazrin. So for those who are interested in cyber, I would say take it on. There's so many different things you can do in cyber. Uh, doesn't need to be coding or technical. For the people or folks who are interested in joining a board, I would say ask the right strategic questions. Don't worry about the tech side of it and really make sure that cyber is embedded into the business practices of the board you are joining. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, what I would say to the women in the audience is don't be afraid to say I. And to the women and the men, don't be afraid to hear it. Because as someone who really values being on teams and values the teams I've built, it's been hard for me in my career when I've been interviewing for positions um, to say I did this and you need to be able to do that even if it goes against your nature or what you've been taught or what we as a society say that we value. So. That's something that I consciously have to guard against. And so um, I would just uh, pass along that piece of advice. Thank you. Jocelyn. I, uh, my piece of advice would be this. Don't be afraid to say yes. I got to be the incident response team leader just because somebody needed someone to work with a team um, that was having just some issues. It was pre-2014 breach. It turned out to be just the most magnificent and interesting and fascinating um, journey. But if I'd said, you know, maybe I have not, don't have that skill set, maybe I won't do that, I would not be here. So don't be afraid to say yes to things that may not yet be within your wheelhouse. Julie? Yeah, I mean, I was going to say something very similar, like take risks, and I don't mean cyber risks. I mean, take <laughs> risks with your career and raise your hand when there's opportunities and take them. Thank you. And Bethany, last word you get. Um, so somewhat similar, I would say, you know, be curious and be a long, a lifelong learner. Um, I have changed in my career in terms of where I've been in an organization from manufacturing to engineering, to product management, to marketing, to biz dev, to corp dev, to, you know, general manager, to CEO. So those are big transitions and they're completely possible for anyone. And so I was just curious and the opportunity came up and back to everybody else's point, I said, yes. Um, and then with, from a board perspective, there's a lot of opportunity there. If you've never been on a board, it, it doesn't matter. It's more important um, what you bring to the table in terms of the, you know, the knowledge and, and, and experience and, and, and thoughtfulness you have. So uh, my advice there is tell everyone you want to be on a board. And surprisingly enough, someone will ask you about that and you might find an opportunity. Awesome advice all around. Thank you. I want to thank our sponsors, the uh, Craig Newmark Philanthropies and the William and Flora Hewlett's uh, organization. I want to thank the amazing team at NYU who helped me put this together. Uh, Elizabeth Watcott, Elisa Fox, Erin O'Brien, and, uh, and the, the whole team behind the scenes. And I want to thank the audience for the fantastic questions that we were working on and with throughout and for attending. And huge thanks you amazing women it's it's an honor it's a privilege it is so fun to get to spend time with you preparing and doing this show today uh so thank you i know you all are insanely busy and appreciate your making time to talk about these critically important issues so stay tuned for our next event in the fall which i think i give you a preview of some of the things we're going to have to discuss and team thank you so much you're amazing thank you thank you Thank okay. you for having us. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.